<laughs> Wicked. Okay. A series of tubes. <laughs> yes. Sometimes they get plugged. Okay. So let me get started. Okay, so your personal information is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Oh, excuse me, this afternoon. And the whole point of this is kind of the information you give away without even knowing it. When you access the web, what are you telling the world about yourself when you just think you're looking at cats, pictures of Lowell's cats online or something, or you're jumping on the Facebook to catch up with someone, or you're sending a tweet? What is all that background information that people are taking with you without your permission? and are slicing and dicing, selling to advertisers, and obviously a lot of this goes very quietly into the background. The idea is that if everything just works and the magic happens, then people don't ask questions. People just stay quiet and they move on. And so that's what we're seeing today a lot with just everything you access the internet. So I'm going to kind of show you some of the kind of how the technology works in the background. I'll you know keep it kind of on the not so technical side for and then we'll see what tools we can use to access, use your favorite social media sites, still access all the amazing things that Google has to offer without kind of handing over your identity and your soul and all that stuff. So why do you care? I mean, people on the internet, internet are nice, right? I mean, like, this is the way it is. Now, interestingly enough, the internet was first designed with this concept in mind. It was created by a bunch of academics, you know, funded by the military, but they were like, we just want to make sure everyone can talk and it's never going to go down. So the people that really put the genius behind it, as you can imagine, right, MIT. And we initially built up an entire infrastructure where I am on best faith going to keep all my information free, everyone should be have full access to everything, we shouldn't have any walls up. Walls was an idea of this 3D world and we had wars and people were really nasty to each other, then we had enlightenment, thus the internet. And the idea was, let's keep it open, let's keep it free, no one's going to do anything naughty on the internet. So, we found out that wasn't quite true. <laughs> um, so here's a few things to know about the internet. Once you put something on the World Wide Web, I'm just going to use as many arcane terms of the internet as I can, because I rarely get to do that in front of people. <laughs> I usually like typing. Okay, so here's the deal. Once you put something up on the internet, it never comes down. It is there forever. If it is a random tweet at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're like, having a great time with my girlfriend going off to Starbucks, well, they're not, you know, that is never going to come down. If you throw a picture up and you're like, I'm not so sure if I should do this, but you do it anyway, it's never coming down. Every email you send is sitting on a backup server of Google somewhere, or AOL, Yahoo, um, MSN, Messenger, all those type of things. They're still sitting out there. So if you ever go to run for office, trust me and believe me, there are people far nerdier than me who will spend their entire lives looking through all that data to pull things out. You ever wonder why you know, your favorite candidate goes to run for something and then all of a sudden something from his high school when he was at a summer camp just kind of pops up out of nowhere? Well, that's because somebody somewhere talked about it and if it ever makes it to the internet, you're never going to delete it. So it's going to be out there. So I, the, one of the problems with putting everything on the web, it's kind of a direction we're going, is that information taken out of context can be very harmful. So if you're trying to do good for the world, but you just say something at the wrong thing, wrong words at the wrong time can really, really destroy you, just personally, um, professionally, politically. And so that's, that's one of the issues that people are facing right now. Is if you ever watch the Republican debates, I think we've had like 21 of them now. Um, a friend was making a comment of mine, he says, these people can't have a coherent conversation. And we were thinking about the reasoning for that. And one of the reasons was, it's nothing to do with Republicans, it's nothing to do with Democrats, it's that we do sound bites. We're a sound bite culture. So everything you say, you have to form an entire argument made out of sound bites, not a logical argument. Because people, we are a society that likes to take things out of context and say, well, remember that one time you said the one thing, that one guy? And well, that's kind of the way we work. Yeah. So that's about going to more of a personal level. If I send an email to a friend saying something very confidential, and that somehow is someone violates my privacy agreements, they get into my Gmail account and they pull it out, they're like, well, look what Connor said. You know, here's the problems he's dealing with. You know, here's some medical conditions. 
but if it's taken out of context, you're not going to get that full story. So that's one of the things to keep in mind as you're throwing everything up on the web and we're blindly trusting that these, these Googles, these Flickers, these Twitter guys, they're all going to do a really good job at protecting your data. So here's some, a quick example of utter privacy failure. Um, as we've kind of moved on, back in the day, I used to do dating through a newspaper. I, I was so untold. <laughs> you would uh, write an article, throw in the newspaper, and you say, you know, here's what I'm looking for, and that's what you need to do. Now it's moving online. You know, it's been online way forever. But there's a lot of. I'm saying more about myself than I thought. <laughs> so what they're finding is that a lot of these dating sites weren't doing anything to protect people's data, really. They said they were, but they weren't. So the EFF recently published a study saying like, how all these major online well, dating sites just utterly failed at protecting your data, and now all those messages you were sending back and forth are now out and available in the world. So again, it's just something where someone was promising, the end user read you know, those 400 lines of the agreement, they're like, oh, okay, this is gonna make sense, you can protect my data. And I know no one actually reads those things. And then, <laughs> then it got destroyed. And then this person, then all these people, all their private information is just out there on the world, in the world. So it's just something to keep in mind. So let's take a look at that. So who am I? It's like the ultimate question of all every philosophical debate, like, who am I? Uh, well, the internet knows. I can tell you that from it right now. They, so let's take a look here. I'm going to pull you something called IP check in. Or actually, I'm going to use this different route. There we go, ipcheck.com. Okay, so this thing right here is your public IP address. This one is, when you go online at home, you jump on your Wi-Fi or whatever, and off you go to the web, you are saying, I am coming from this address. This effectively, you can use it as, it is your postal code. When someone wants to send you a letter, they send it to your mailing address, and all mail between you and the rest of the world goes to this IP address. This changes with every, if you're at home, it's gonna be address number one, if we're here on the Wi-Fi, it's address number two. So it's it's bound to every, um, let's say, internet installation. So the I like to say every location has access to an internet. It's going to have a different one of these. So you're like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go to Starbucks one day. I'm going to be home another day. But patterns start to develop of who you are, and I'm going to show you a lot more information in this place. Who you are, uh, like traffic behavior. We notice that on this particular IP address. All of a sudden, all these like lulls, cats, and things kind of coming up. Oh, I'm noticing this trend. Connor must be moving and showing here and watching pictures of funny kittens playing the piano or something. And we're seeing this go on. And I was talking to a friend the other day, and he noticed that his public IP address hasn't changed for his home Comcast in five years. Now, generally, the way it used to work was that you just you know you plug it in, you'd ask the the Comcast guy, Hey, can I have an IP address? Can I have my new home address? And that could change every few hours, every few weeks. But he knows that over the last five years, it hasn't changed, it's always been the same. And we were thinking, well, reason, why is that? Well, this also helps you with targeted advertisements. If I know that coming from this IP address, we have this type of traffic behavior, I can um, pretty well assume, in this particular case, there's a lady in the house, there's a man in the house, wait, we've got Nickelodeon shows, hey, there must be kids in the house. So now the advertisements become more targeted. So good or bad, I don't know. But that's one of the ways that this, in, this something innocuous as having a public IP address is now beginning to identify people in the 3D world with the internet world. Uh, here, so here's another thing. Detecting your browser. As you, you may not know, like I'm on Firefox right now. Um, and if I always use Firefox, that's going to start telling the world a little about Khan. Um, you can actually do this thing called fingerprinting. If you want to get some more information on that term, fingerprinting, the EFF has done, it's like, maybe you define EFF, the Electronic Freedom Foundation, that gentleman there is wearing a, a t-shirt with the EFF on it. So if you're ever doing anything technologically um, and you kind of get in trouble, they're the best lawyers to have on your side as EFF. If you're ever, and if you ever want to support a group that does a lot of good stuff on advocacy for people's rights on the internet, EFF, um, does a really good job of that as well. So, the EFF did a, uh, did a very nice article on, <clears throat> on making this, all this nerdy stuff more human readable. But what it tells the world is, here's like in the browser versions, here's what I'm doing, 
Um, here's my Firefox version. Here are the plugins I have. Here are my add-ons that I have, so on and so forth. One of the things I noticed when I was doing some research a few weeks ago was that there was this new type of um, drive-by, what they call drive-by viruses. So you just browse the web and then you move on to the next thing and you look at the next funny cat picture and off you go. And little do you know that there was an exploit, there was a hole, a um, security hole in your browser that someone took advantage of. And they said, okay, he's, he's vulnerable, I'm going to drop this virus on this computer, he's going to move on. You never have to install anything, you never have to really click on anything, you just have to open the link, um, the link to the web. And what they're doing is actually getting more and more intelligent. Because they're saying, whoa, instead of just doing like the shotgun effect of trying to throw a virus at every single one who comes our way, let's step back. Let's assess every browser that comes to our website. And we can specifically identify every browser. And if it's vulnerable, then we'll attack. But if it's not, then we won't attack. So you're getting like 98% success rates because you're targeting this virus to what you're going for. What it does is it kind of keeps things quieter, your um, antivirus guys, are just, it's going to take longer to you know, throw up red flags because it's being successful and it's not failing. So <clears throat> that's something else that's coming up we're seeing a lot of and we're also seeing, as I mentioned, pattern behavior um, that if I have a bunch of um, Firefox plugins that creates a very specific and unique fingerprint and then if I do that and I jump around and people do a huge aggregate data, they could be like, oh okay, this kid we see from this type of browser, this must, must be a Connor that's moving along here. So you can start to track Connor a little more by looking at what's available. So, oh, da -da, let's see, and then there was this guy here, I just want to show you this Oh, man, forget it, that's way nerdy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make a quick comment? Yeah, please. When you run that, they have a test on the AFF site that you check your browser, browser, and they'll tell you just how unique you are. You'll, you'll, you'll be shocked. That you're you're at a very, very small percentage of the public. If you've got any any normal adjustments and modifications you made to it, it's not quite as good as a personal fingerprint, but it's damn close. Yes, yeah, it's wow. it's frightening. It's scary. Uh, also, uh, yes, what about cookies and other things that yeah. they just simply store on your Dude, I'm gonna like pay you for that comment. That's <laughs> <laughs> like my next slide. So, so yes, yeah, so we're gonna talk about cookies in a second, actually. But that's very, very good. Um, so another thing was targeted advertisements. I don't know if you've ever been on a website and they're like, "Hey, meet sexy girls in your area," and then like they throw up your zip code or whatever. But the, all they're doing is they're taking that public IP address I was telling you about, and they're saying, "Well, this IP address we know is coming from Cambridge, Massachusetts." So then we just substitute the text everywhere. Because I lived in this place called Gerber, California once, and if you don't know where it is, that is to your benefit. And they're like, meet sexy girls. I'm like, dude, I know the girls. So you're not the slightest. So, um, so um, is there any hope, really? I mean, if we start looking at this world where everyone's being tracked by IP addresses, you have these fingerprints going, um, we haven't even talked about things you start to sign in, like Facebook, Google, um, Twitter. This is all stuff that you don't have to sign up. There's no I accept button. This is just simply you jumping on the web. There are, there are tools like proxies where you can bounce through something. So instead of me going saying, hey, Google, I want that information, and it does that whole fingerprint analysis and everything, it says, okay, here you go, and here's, here's your search results. What I do is I go through an intermediary called a proxy, and then from there I pass to Google. And what that does, it gives me not really, uh, it's kind of anonymous, it's, we'll talk about some more robust solutions, it's, but it does help you. It does kind of put one layer of a mask over you, so you do have some sort of privacy. One of the quick and free solutions if you ever want to use them, um, it's actually called hidemyass.com, it's got a picture of a donkey on it. Um, but you just it pulls it up and you kind of have like a Google search bar and you just kind of use, you access Google through there or you access your websites through there. And what you, all you do is you get an extra bounce between someone and they're pretty good. So. And that's a proxy? It's a proxy, yes. It's a single, what we call a one hot proxy. Because if the good ones tore, but I assume you're going to mention it. Yes, sir. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Have um, you seen this crowd? <laughs> Cookies. But I like the cookie. <laughs> I just put 
signature is like super cute. It says, I made your cookie, but I ate it. <laughs> so, you get to. so anyway, so cookies are awesome. The cookies are great. What they do is their initial intention was, I'm going to go to a website, I'm going to do some customization like, hey, I, I do want these settings, I don't want those settings. And the cookie sits in the background and remembers that. It's a little text file, really. So it's just, just one, no, just a small text file sits back there. And talks to the server and says, hey, when you go back to this website, remember to use all these customizations so that my experience as an end user is better. If I sign in to something, Google, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, they are going to take that cookie and drop it in there. Have you ever noticed that when you go and log into your Gmail account, you can close out all of your browsers and then open it up again and you're still signed in? The reason is because they have that cookie. And that just sits there quietly in the background and so that when you open it again, hey, I'm still logged in, and on you go. It makes your life easier. Well, what they said was, this is genius. Everyone's got cookies turned on by default. Everyone wants to have like this built-in life is a little bit easier with cookies, and they're a great tool. But one of the things they started doing is they started saying, okay, I'm going to drop a cookie. So Connor's always signed into Google. I'm all, Connor's always signed into whatever it is. And it makes my life a little easier. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start monitoring where does Connor start visiting after he's gone to the other websites. And it's going to start reporting back to the mothership. Hey, we notice that after Connor checks his um, Google account, he starts looking for pictures of cute kittens. So we should start sending him targeted advertisements for cute kittens. And it starts going like that. So that's one of the things that cookies can kind of be a downfall. And it's very simple to deal with, you know, like once a week or whatever, just go clear your cookies. And you'll have to sign back into a few things, but it's a very simple means of just kind of protecting yourself a little bit. Um, <clears throat> um, yes, please. Are you going to talk about third-party cookies? Um, I wasn't, but um, quick thing with third-party cookies. Um, why don't we save it for our stories? Because I would like, but it brings up a good point where you have more than one person. When you visit the website, you have more than one person dropping cookies on your um, on your on your computer, and more than one person. Right. And that's where the real tracking comes from. They're also yeah. off by default now in Firefox. So yes, so Firefox has this amazing setting where you can say, "Do not track me," and a lot of those kind of built-in customizations start to happen where there's a little more protection. Um, we'll talk about that in just saying, "You guys are amazing." <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. So let's talk about the big boys. Swimming with the fishes. We got Google, who is the intellectual. We got Facebook, who's a jock. Nobody really likes what he does, but everybody wants to hang out with him. We got, <laughs> we got, we got Twitter, they're the hipsters. They've done some really cool things, um, and we'll talk about them. But now Google has actually done some really, really, really cool stuff. They generally are lampooned as being like, oh, they're the new Microsoft. They're the big bad boys on the block. Yeah, they don't do everything that's great. But they have this motto as, don't be evil, and they've generally stuck to that pretty well. <clears throat> One thing they did a while back, I think it was like a year ago, they turned on HTTPS access for your Gmail by default, which means that when you access your email, it used to be, like two or three years ago, you actually, if you access your email at a cafe, anybody who knew what they were doing could be on a laptop sitting next to you and reading your emails. Google said, Hey, we're gonna make we're gonna invest our own money into our servers to make our service better, and then turn on HTTPS, which puts a, an encryption tunnel between you. So that same person with the same tool sitting next to you can no longer read your emails. They can't jump in the middle of the stream there. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, wow, way to go, Google. What it was is a very good e economic decision by Google because they said, if we know people are starting to get um, cold feet and they don't want to use their services, they're gonna jump out. So we're going to take the initiative and make sure everyone's got um, HTTPS turned on. If you're using Google Plus applications or their new service, these little circles, I still don't quite get it. But um, since day one, they've had HTTPS turned on, and they've done some really good things in protecting your data. So, sir. I think the more important con comment about all these people mm -hmm. is to remember that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. I mean, they are selling access to you for advertising. So despite the fact that they're being very nice about the fact that they're encrypting your tunnel and protecting you that way, they are still selling you to advertising, all of them. And that's, that's exactly right. right. Well, and just to repeat, and there's another thing. Yes, sir. Early on, Google hired some, shall we say, supposedly former NSA programmers. Mm -hmm. The only question is, do they still get their own paycheck or not? And yeah. uh, you can guess what my suspicion is. 
Yes. <laughs> and so there has been some controversy that I really don't know. Honestly, just don't know. But to the gentleman's point here, if you are not paying for anything, do not be fooled that you are the product. Your information is being resold. And that's how they make the money. And you just got to know that. You know. So they're doing things. What they're doing is they're making sure that only they are seeing your data. That's kind of Google's idea. Let's make sure only they are the person that's seeing your data and for giving you that kind of protection. Facebook's a different story. Okay. Um, some nice things on that Google, oh, excuse me, that Google's been doing. They have the Family Safety Center. Um, again, this is a idea of basic tips and tools if you got kids in the house, how to how to use Google services better to filter out adult content, to make life a little safer, so on and so forth. So Google and their own devs put this out. Again, they're doing this to, it's all economic. They want to keep you there. But they could be a lot worse about it. So you know, it's when they're doing a nice thing. I don't want to stare at gift portion of the mouth. Um, so there we go. Um, yeah, so like every, they are very cute. They got a great logo, lots of nice colors. But they are, advert, they are collecting everything. They're analyzing everything. And they're reselling everything. There was something that's just happened in the last few mm -hmm. days about Google policy, their information retention thing. Yes. There was an opt-out period or you had to do something for that and it was a very short time. A lot of people didn't find out about it in time. And I don't know the details. You, you can actually opt out. They just, they, they just centralized their data servers. Yeah. That was all that happened. That was the only change. Is that they there's something you could say, forget certain things about me. No. Yes, you could delete your yes. history, but let's let's take that for afterwards. That's okay. a really, really good question. Talking about what happens when a big company that everyone relies on, like Google, says, oh, we're going to change our uh, terms and services of the agreements, and it's either going to become better for you or worse for you, but pretty much we're making the decision. So Google's making the decision, and every, us as end users, we just have to deal with the consequences of it. We don't have much say in that. So we can talk about that later, how that affects us and some of the recent things that have happened. But um, and they were already keeping all your mail for every reason you believe it, so yes. I don't know what else they done. Um, so I'm going to move on to Facebook, and I have to, again, confess some like really nerdy stuff. Okay, so there was this thing called the IT Crowd. It was a TV series. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> And I'm probably sure this is a copyright violation or something, but this one crowd, I think I can get away with that. It's educational, so it's fair use. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so it is educational, so let's take a look at that. Okay. Oh, shoot, it's not loud enough. One sec, guys. Ah, fail. Epic fail. Okay, let me just turn this up so everyone can hear it. Do you want to plug it to my speakers? Um, let me see if I can make it loud enough. One thing I know is technology likes to fail for the worst possible time. Let's see. Um, Start this over, and if people, we'll see what's left. Like.
Twitter, again, has enabled HTTPS by default, which means the guy in the coffee shop is not going to steal your data. But the whole point of Twitter is that the world sees your data. So, um, so let's talk about some of the, some of the other guys, um, like the government. Um, the, like the Iranian government recently, they started to block all encrypted traffic, which means if you were in Iran and you wanted to access the internet, they had to be able to see it. Like they have to be able to sit in the middle, in line, and be able to you know see all the data going back and forth. And if you try the interventions to get around that, they just cut you off and you couldn't access it. And that was a few weeks ago. The way all this kicked up, Tor to the rescue. Uh, the, the Tor project came in and they updated a bunch of software and they did a very good job of getting it. So people in Iran who are like humanitarians who are trying to do really really good work over there can now access the world and share the data and talk to people without the Iranian government spying on them. So. Yes, quickly. Yes, but it depended on all of us to do that because their the normal tour entry points are well known. Yes. And they will block all of us. So they wanted people to volunteer to take a few people in through their site, and you'll never be an exit point, but just an entry point. And they would only hand you out to a very small number of people in these suppressive countries. Why don't we talk about tour? Because uh, he seems to be very knowledgeable on that. Tour is a really, really cool project. Um, Tor's done a fantastic job, and I do want to give it the time and the credits it deserves. So maybe during lunch you can grab me and we can talk about that. Um, so I was trying to the, the, Tor, the Tor project, if you Google that, a T-O-R is Tor. The onion router. The onion router. Um, no affiliation with the onion router. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One important point about HTTPS, HTTPS, I can never say that, is that it protects your password. I mean, yes. you joke about, you know, you're sending your data to Twitter and it's public anyway. Well, it protects as your password, so your account can't get hijacked. You, you, you hope it does. There's a ways the government can get it in the middle of the Maybe I'll save it for lunchtime, guys. Coffee house is going to do No, so, I mean the coffee house, but that's what it protects. Okay, um, so let's see. So, oh, man, moved over for me. So the question is really, so what? Who really cares? I mean, like, honestly, if everyone just steals my data and it's already out there, I, whenever I talk to people, they're like, so what? You know, they already know everything about, there is to know about me. I'm not doing anything wrong. Why should I care? You know, I'm, I'm a good, outstanding citizen. I pay my taxes. You know, I go to pirate party conventions. You know, I'm, I'm a normal guy, you know, and so what, what does it matter? Well, the question is, since when was it okay for everyone to know everything about you? Generally, the way people interacted was, you kind of, to steal something from a, from a movie, came into the circle of trust, you know. You brought people in and you said, you know, I, I trust you, you're good, and I'm going to tell you this about myself. And But we're moving to a society where everyone's sharing everything with everybody, and I think it's going to lead to a lot of unintended consequences, like things taking things out of context. Uh, if you're, <laughs> for whatever it might be. So it's just some questions we want to start asking ourselves is, what is this going to have, particularly as the next generation of people are um, coming along, and we have, like, my peers and older who have kids and stuff, they're, like, seven years old jumping on Facebook and telling the world everything about themselves. And it's like, that might not be okay if other seven-year-olds are reading that, or it might not be okay. How is that going to change society? Where are those, where are those boundaries and barriers going to end or last or not be there at all? What's what's going to happen down the road? And the answer is, I frankly have no idea. The one serious thing is, you can assume that an HR department or somebody in any major corporation you're applying for a job for will find anything they can about you on the web ahead of time. That is actually a very good point. Um, and recently, an article came out that my dad sent me, and he was talking about how people were going into interviews and. They were sitting down, interviews going really well. They're like, you know, we'd love to give you the job, but we need you to sign into your Facebook account right now so we can take a look at it. And this is actually happening to people. If a lot of major colleges will, if you're on the track, if you're on an athlete, you'll have to Facebook friend a coach, or you'll have to, or or someone else is a moderator, and they just sit there and they watch your social media to make sure that you're not behaving inappropriately. And so the um, ACL, AC. ACULA, they fought this and they're still fighting it. Um, and they're like, because it's wrong. You know, it just, there's, there's got to be a sense of like professionalism. It's like where I can be myself uh, at home and then when I go to, go to work the next day, I can put on a suit and I can go and I can be professional. And again, that's where those boundaries are going to lie. How much does my employer need to know about what I do on a Friday night? That's a real good question. So, to play, play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. um, there's also circumstances when giving out your information can have a protective 
aspect of it. So for instance, there's this guy named Jamie Love, who's a pharmaceutical um, I guess advocacy person. Yeah. And he talks a lot about you know openness issues that I think probably resonate with the group. But what he does, he has a blog where he posts lots and lots of stuff, kind of to the point where you know, it could be even seen as trivial, but as a way, it's like a form of protection. Because should something happen to him, you know, you could see what's been going on in that last month that would facilitate something happening to him. So like he's been held up at gunpoint, but you know he know he he'll post that. It's not a secret, and people will be able to go in and see kind of what's happening to him and figure out why. And having that information out there is is somewhat protective. And that and that's an interesting way of using it. Actually, I heard of a gentleman who um, right after 9/11 he was from Egypt and he was being followed. He had done obviously nothing to do with it, but he decided to be followed and profiled a lot from these guys um, in suits. He had no idea who they were. So what he did is he turned on geolocation on his phone, which said, tell Twitter where I'm sitting every time I do a tweet. And every half an hour, he would tweet. So when, so like, like a month later or whatever, when we went to court, he said, hold on, I know, I can tell you, I can prove by a third party where I've been for the last month and I have nothing in fact to do about this. So that is a cool way of using it for protection. But in both these cases, both of those gentlemen, both those people, got to do it voluntarily. They got to say, you know what, I would like to use this as a tool to protect myself, and they weren't doing it, and it wasn't being done behind their back without their permission. Yeah. So, was it uh, in uh, Bahrain, <coughs> Zainab Akhawaja, mm -hmm. she's, hasn't, she's been spared some of the worst of the treatment because She's such a Twitter loudmouth. That's what her sister said. It, really? it keeps her safe. I mean, when she stopped posting on, on February 12th, you know, everyone, I, I, I write, well, where are you all right? Are you in jail? And everyone, you know, immediately, like, where is she? That's interesting. Hmm. But, yeah. sorry. So I've only got like five more minutes, so I just want to throw out some cool tools. If you guys want to know um, some, uh, some further research that you can do on this, uh, I've got some, some very informative links that you might want to take a look at from the EFF, actually from Google, um, not the site, but Google the company, <laughs> and uh, some of the tools I brought up today. I have a list of Firefox extensions, um, actually let me just bring that over, and what this does is these are, one of the things I love about Firefox is that because they're open source, everyone can kind of create these, um, these plugins for them, and you've got things like NoScript, which says that when I log on a website, all that background stuff, those third parties, there, that stuff's not allowed to run. And I, as a end user, can say, I'm going to access this site and only this site. None of that extra garbage that comes on prepackaged. It's a very, 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 very powerful um, tool. Um, it allows you as an end user, if you go to a web page, you're like, wait, this is still kind of funky. Why isn't it all working? You simply click a button and say, oh, I want to allow these sites and these scripts to run. Very, very nice and simple to use. Very powerful. It's probably one of the most powerful things um, you can do to avoid getting analyzed by Google all the time. Um, HTTPS Everywhere, this is created by the EFF. Uh, what this does is this says, if I go to a website and it has the possibility for encrypting the tunnel, then go to that and just do the encryption. Just, it, the idea is that you're going to fail safe. You're going to be failing into the direction where there's more encryption, a little more protection. And something came across really interestingly, it's called the Web of Trust, um, different than the Circle of Trust. Um, the Web of Trust, what it does, it's, it's a community-based um, it's a plugin you put in, and every time you go to a website, it gives you a little circle of it's like green, orange, red, different colors, and it tells you if it's safe to go here. If it's saying, and it's like, so what does if you have a user, you say, I'm going to go to, you know, funnycats.com, whatever, and then you find out this is not a site I want to go to. I have no idea if that's a site. It's like, that's not a site anyone really wants to go. It's not what it's advertising, it's not what it's delivering you. You can put a quick rating in there and say, this domain is untrustworthy. They do not handle my data well. They don't give me what I promised, um, so on and so forth. You find out there's been a security breach with them. You can go here. So then the next person who comes in has this plug-in installed. Be like, oh, I want to stay away from that link. I want to go to the next one. You know, so this is an idea where it's the, you're allowing the community to tell you the security and, the, um, and it tells you the security of the website you're going to. Um, and there's a few others that I've mentioned here. This is from the EFF. And then ad block just blocks ads. Yep. Um, big props to Ghostery, which is mm -hmm. the yeah. extension that will show you what third party mm -hmm. cookies are, are tracking you and will pop up a little window on the right hand side of the screen telling you what tracking cookies are being you know dropped on your browser and then you can turn them off 
December one is Firefox's Mozilla's collusion, which will show you the web of connection between you know the trackers and you know, which website are using the trackers. Interesting. I heard that. Pretty cool. Can you explain why you focused on Firefox? Because I know Chrome has a lot of these similar ones, like HTTPS mm -hmm. everywhere and Adblock and those. Uh, mainly because I like Firefox. I mean, honestly, Chrome is probably one of the, it's one of the most secure browsers out there. Um, just remember that Chrome is built by Google for Google, um, so that it's kind of hard if you're trying to kind of move out of the Google world. Um, it's kind of hard to do that with Chrome. So it, you know, so that's kind of one things. But again, they do allow you to make extensions. They do have a lot of good things, and it is currently the most secure browser to use, where you're not going to get those uh, drive-by viruses I was telling you about. Um, a few other tools you can do, um, hard disk encryption, we recently saw a lady that encrypted her hard drive and then was raided by the police, um, and because it was encrypted, they couldn't pull the data off her computer, it was a huge thing where they were going to force her to decrypt her laptop, and the Supreme Court, I think the Supreme Court ruled that to force someone to decrypt their own laptop um, is a violation of the Fifth Amendment, and they don't have to decrypt their own laptop. So, if you're doing anything, Actually, it's just a really good idea to start doing it. Yeah, good, bad, or ugly. Let you be the judge of that, but just, just encrypt your drive. It's free, it works, it's great, true encrypt is awesome. Another thing, do your updates. Honestly, it's like one of the simplest things people often forget about it. If you're on a Windows, just Linux, Mac, whatever, just do your updates. I mean, it's really, it's going to help you. It's not going to help you with the privacy issues, it's just going to stop you from getting like viruses and crap like that. Um, and then here's some research, and I can give these links to anyone who wants them. Oh, it will help you with the privacy. I was talking earlier about HTTPS has been raped by the government for certain things so that they are man in the middle intentionally. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's a quiet move to update your trusted, you know, um, the certificates. certificates. Yeah. And that was going on quietly because the industry at some level knew that that kind of shenanigans is going on. It probably is still going on. But some of that was to clean out that, and that would have been done in your updates. Okay. Convergence is a good experimental uh, um, thing to, to test the quality of, it does a notary to test the SSL certificate. One more, but that's great. So we've got two people who are highly endorsing, um, sorry, I Convergence. Convergence, thank you. So again, um, I was just to say the other thing to watch out for is that the most, one of the most common things still is uh, phishing attacks. Social engineering, always be suspicious of anyone on the internet who asks you for anything, especially passwords or anything else. But you know, the easiest way to get people to give you your information isn't hack or write scripts it's or viruses, it's just ask and people hand it to you. That's exactly true. And <laughs> one last one there, yes. Yes, it changes your IP address, and can, you can now set letting, you can set settings to say if you want JavaScript and things to run as well, which can also give away a lot of information. So. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.